You know, one of the most common comments that I get in this channel is people are American that every single time they watch one of my videos, they get a Jordan Peterson video suggested as the next video by YouTube. So it was interesting when I saw that in response to the announcement that Jordan Peterson is going to be releasing a new book, another 12 Rules for Life in the New Year, that uh, in response to employees of Penguin Publishing objecting to publishing this purveyor of hate speech and transphobia, that the publisher said that Jordan Peterson had, quote, helped millions of people who are on the fringes of society who would otherwise be radicalised by alt-right groups. So I think it has become quite clear that Jordan Peterson's sudden popularity a few years ago was in large part a response to the growth of the alt-right and dissident nationalist movements on the internet, an attempt to corral those disenfranchised young men back into the safe space of classical liberalism. Now plenty has been said about the inadequacy of something like classical liberalism as a political doctrine to answer the problems of our day. So I'm not going to cover that too much, but instead what I want to talk about is the failure of Jordan Peterson's attempted response to the nihilism and relativism of postmodernism. I want to talk about why Jordan Peterson fails. Now it's well known that Jordan Peterson appeals to a certain demographic, namely young alienated men, men that have never had a strong father figure in their life perhaps, men that have never been told the most basic truths about life, like that they should clean their room and take on responsibility. And so there's something quite refreshing about this uh, educated college professor telling them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and become the men that they should be. And there is something more fundamental going on, which is that by reaching back to the moral tradition of the West, Peterson appeals to people who have been deprived of a cultural inheritance by decades of historical whitewashing facilitated by liberal individualism. The problem, of course, is this is the same liberal individualism that Jordan Peterson himself champions. Jordan Peterson offers the choice of returning to modernist forms of thought as an alternative to the postmodern excesses. But the problem is that Peterson never deals with the fundamental problem that the failures of modernism themselves created the alienation, irony and cynicism characteristic of postmodernism. In fact, Peterson's entire worldview, influenced as he is by Nietzsche and Jung, is actually distinctively modernist. Peterson opposes postmodernism with the modernist trio of liberalism in politics, pragmatism in epistemology, and a heavy use of psychoanalysis in understanding religion and metaphysics, as well as that unholy trinity of liberalism, pragmatism and psychoanalysis. Another way that Peterson shows himself to be a modernist thinker is in his rejection of metaphysics. A primary characteristic of modernism is the rejection of idealism that was, up to the 19th century, the popular form of metaphysics and metaphysics itself. This can be seen in important 19th and 20th century figures like Nietzsche, Heidegger, Bertrand Russell, the logical positivists and Ludwig Wittgenstein. And as part of this larger turn against metaphysical concerns, a feature of modernism is its claim that literature is a supreme and irreplaceable form of understanding. Peterson embodies this strain of modernist thought with his focus on literature as a way to uncover meaning that is more useful than philosophy. From his modernist starting point, let's have a look at Jordan Peterson's criticism of postmodernism taken directly from his own website. Peterson writes that postmodernism is essentially the claim that one, since there are an innumerable number of ways in which the world can be interpreted and perceived, and those are tightly associated, then number two, no canonical manner of interpretation can be reliably derived. That's the fundamental claim. An immediate secondary claim, and this is where the Marxism emerges, is something like, since no canonical manner of interpretation can be reliably derived, all interpretation variants are best interpreted as the struggle for different forms of power. There is no excuse whatsoever for the secondary claim, except that it allows the resentful pathology of Marxism to proceed in a new guise. The first claim is true but incomplete, 
The fact that there are an unspecifiable number of interpretations does not mean, or even imply, that there are an unspecifiable number of valid interpretations. What does valid mean? That's where an intelligent pragmatism comes into it. Valid at least means when the proposition or interpretation is acted out in the world, the desired outcome within the specific time frame ensues. That's a pragmatic definition of truth from within the confines of the American pragmatism of William James and C.S. Pierce. Validity is constrained by the necessity for iteration, among other factors. Your interpretations have to keep you, at minimum, alive and not suffering too badly today, tomorrow, next week, next month and next year in a context defined by you, your family, your community and the broader systems you are part of. That makes for very tight constraints on your perception, interpretations, actions. Games have to be iterable, playable and perhaps desirable to the players. As Jean Piaget took pains to point out in his work on equilibration. So let's take a look at this. This is the meat of Jordan Peterson's criticism of postmodern neo Marxism, as he calls it. Peterson says valid means, quote, when the proposition or interpretation is acted out in the world, the desired outcome within the specific time frame ensues. Now the problem with this is that this just begs the question of how we should understand what quote, the desired outcome means. Peterson chastises postmodernists for saying truth claims are just something cynically used by competing actors to achieve and maintain power. But Peterson wishes to equate truth with whatever works in a given situation. Peterson's argument that we have limited cognitive capacities to consider any number of possible perspectives is true, but it's not a refutation of what postmodernists believe. If validity is constrained by necessity, as Peterson says in this argument, and this necessity relates to our survival, i.e. we must exist to hold these interpretations in the first place, then this is just to make the banal observation that some interpretations are better for our survival than others. This is totally obvious and would not be denied by anyone, postmodern or otherwise. But let's look at how Peterson's test of validity works in practice. If we believe that the correct interpretation of things is that life is not worth living and we would all be better to commit suicide, this is obviously a theory that fails Peterson's test of validity. But Peterson's refutation would end up being something like the belief that you should kill yourself is wrong because if you kill yourself, you will no longer be alive. If Peterson's argument makes sense, then antinatalist ethical theories would be self-evidently wrong. Now, antinatalism is a school of thought that ascribes a negative value to being born. Peterson's response would have to be something like, of course antinatalism is wrong because it would lead to our species no longer surviving. But since the value of survival is precisely what is being disputed by the antinatalist, Peterson in this case is just begging the question. Peterson's criteria for survival value as a test of truth is totally arbitrary and lacks any objective content. Similar to Stefan Molyneux arguing that objective morality exists in the form of universally preferable behaviour because it must be presupposed to enter into an argument, Peterson is doing a similar sleight of hand trick, trying to make it seem as if he has derived the moral value from an empirical fact. Peterson is trying to overcome the is all problem that you can't derive prescriptive statements from facts about the world, but in the end, all he succeeds in doing is cleverly hiding how meaningless his test of validity actually is. Now, Peterson was forced to lay out and defend his distinctive form of what we might call evolutionary pragmatism in a discussion with Sam Harris. And as you'll see in this discussion, he made some very radical statements about the nature of truth. The only final way of sorting out whether a scientific claim is sufficiently true is through Darwinian means. Because I think that the Darwinian process is the only way of adjudicating truth. Now, you don't, you don't accept that, and that's fine. I agree about the, the non-utility of 
playing fatal games, right? So we, we don't want to play games that will get us all killed reliably. Certainly, if there's no huge benefit on the, the well, other from side. from a scientific perspective, why not? But then you're just saying that, is there a scientific reason to want to exist or to want your kids to live happy lives as opposed to die in their sleep tonight? Yes, that is partly what I'm saying, yes. We can talk about that, but it seems to me we can't just skip over this question of truth because it anchors everything else we, any other well, claim I, we're well, going to make. No, well, no, well, but another thing to do would, you know, look, fair enough. And we could argue about it for quite a while. And I think the pro the danger is, is that we'll sidetrack the entire conversation doing this and that that won't be so useful. So what I would recommend is um, that we could recognize for the moment that we're starting with different claims of truth. But but I don't think we are. I, th I think you're you're simply deciding at the end of the day to say that any truths that led us down a path where we suffered unnecessarily or died weren't true. Right. You have to choose what you mean by true. You have to. And I'm not accepting the, the same definition of truth that you operate under. because, And it's partly because I believe that Darwin trumps realism, let's say. I believe that pragmatism trumps realism. Now, here's the fundamental problem. Peterson objects to postmodernism in part because it leaves us lost epistemologically. It removes the possibility of objective knowledge and makes communication nothing more than the expression of a power struggle. However, this kind of epistemological nihilism is precisely what he himself commits to when he espouses his own form of evolutionary pragmatism. Peterson's solution to the loss of an objective basis for truth or right action is to insist on some kind of transcendent value to provide a basis for these other values. Peterson arbitrarily makes evolution his transcendent value, and this leads to his proposed solution of evolutionary pragmatism where truth is whatever is evolutionarily useful for the survival of the species. Our conceptual frameworks are true insofar as they are maximally functional with respect to survival. In other words, what evolutionary psychologists would call adaptive behaviour is itself truth. And Pearson uses this shaky foundation to justify things like Jungian archetypes, myths, and even belief in God as all true in this way. And let's see how Peterson actually applies this method to the question of God. Now, before Coming across this, which is the clearest answer of his I could find to this question, I had to go through a number of videos where Peterson was asked about belief in God and gave what I can only describe as obfuscating, uh, imprecise answers, basically refusing to answer the question, either saying that it was a, a private matter or an impossible question to answer or that uh, nobody knew what the word God meant, these kinds of answers. But he eventually was pushed for an answer by Sam Harris, and this is eventually what he comes out with as his definition of the God that he believes in. So, God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time. As the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest of time frames, but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects in the here and now. So what that means in some sense is that you have conceptions of reality built into your biological and metaphysical structure that are a consequence of processes of evolution that, that occurred over unbelievably vast expanses of time and that structure your perception of reality in ways that it wouldn't be structured if you only lived for the amount of time that you're going to live. And that's also part of the problem of deriving values from facts because you're evanescent and, and you can't derive the right values from the facts that portray themselves to you in your lifespan, which is why you have a biological structure that's like 3.5 billion years old. So God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. That's a fundamental element of hero mythology. God is the highest value in the hierarchy of values. That's another way of looking at it. God is what calls and what responds in the eternal call to adventure. God is the voice of conscience. God is the source of judgment and mercy and guilt. God is the future to which we make sacrifices and something akin to the transcendental repository of reputation. 
Here's a cool one if you're an evolutionary biologist. God, <laughs> God, God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. So, you know, men arrange themselves into hierarchies and then men rise in the hierarchy. And there's principles that are important that determine the probability of their rise. And those principles aren't tyrannical power. They're something like the ability to articulate truth and the ability to be competent and the ability to make appropriate moral judgments. And if you can do that in a given situation, then all the other men will vote you up the hierarchy, so to speak, and that will radically increase your reproductive fitness. And the operation of that process across long expanses of time looks to me like it's codified in something like the notion of God the Father. It's also the same thing that makes women, men attractive to women. Because men, women peel off the top of the male hierarchy, and the question is, what should be at the top of the hierarchy? And the answer right now is tyranny as part of the patriarchy, but the real answer is something more like the ability to use truthful speech in the service of, let's say, well-being. And so that's, that's something that operates across tremendous expanses of time, and it plays a role in the selection for survival itself, which makes it a fundamental reality. So... Peterson claims to believe in God and then defines God as reified, evolutionarily adaptive behavior. Because evolution has ultimate transcendent value, because survival has ultimate transcendent value. But why does evolution and survival have ultimate value? Well, at that point, Peterson can't give you an answer. And here we see the problem of someone like Peterson trying to make a satisfactory rebuttal of postmodernism. Modernism and postmodernism both share the assumption of anti-realist theories of epistemology. Peterson is left in the desert of the real, trying to plug a metaphysical gap created by modernity. But without the necessary tools, he is then forced to try and revive a Christian morality by arbitrarily assigning absolute value to evolution and then making a pragmatic case for reconstructing a symbolic Christianity as an expression of a reoccurring religious monomyth. Peterson may be right that this is the most beneficial course for our survival, but the problem remains that he is making a pragmatic case for objective values. Peterson wants us to act as if God is real because it's useful, not because it's true. He tries to avoid the charge of relativism by conflating the two. As stated at the beginning of this video, the problem with Jordan Peterson's project is that it isn't radical enough. Differences between postmodernism and modernism are more differences of degree rather than any fundamental opposition in their nature or their assumptions about the world. The division between postmodernism and modernism is arbitrary enough that some theorists have even rejected the idea of postmodernism as a movement separate from modernism rather than its continuation. Sigmund Bauman contended that modernity had always in fact been characterised by an ambivalent, dual nature. At once, modern society is largely characterised by a need for order, a need to quantify and rationalise the world so that it can be controlled, predicted and understood. At the same time, modernity is also characterised by radical change, a constant overthrowing of tradition, culture and old relations. For Bauman, Postmodernity is the result of a shift in focus due to modernity's failure to rationalise the world, thus leading to a refocus on its capacity for constant change. Bauman thus thinks that the label postmodernism is wrong. Instead, choosing to define this shift as liquid modernity to emphasise the increased focus on flux. This is all to say that, unless one is serious about critiquing the whole project of modernity itself, Criticisms directed at postmodernism are always going to be lacking in some way. Postmodern thinkers like Foucault largely built on the work of modernist thinkers like Nietzsche, Marx and Freud. Richard Rorty, one of the most influential postmodern philosophers, was following in the same tradition of American pragmatism that Peterson himself claims to be an advocate of. The closer one looks at Peterson's own beliefs and someone like Rorty, the harder it becomes to distinguish what it is in Peterson's own thought that is such a radical rejection of postmodernism. Now, to go back to Peterson's criticism of postmodernism, he claims that, quote, an immediate secondary claim 
and this is where the Marxism emerges, is something like, since no canonical manner of interpretation can be reliably derived, all interpretation variants are best interpreted as the struggle for different forms of power. So what to make of Peterson's claim that postmodernism and Marxism are natural bedfellows due to the propensity of each one to see all competing ideas as power struggles? Well firstly there is the fact that Marx did not think that all theories are just attempts to grab power in the Foucaultian sense. He didn't think, for example, that dialectical materialism or the labour theory of value were just power grabs and predicted a day when there would be no competition for power in the first place at the end of history since a communist society would be a classless society. If anything, it's the influence of Nietzsche, who, again, Peterson himself is quite fond of, on Foucault. Not to mention that Foucault himself made a sharp break with Marxism during his intellectual career. But here are a few other examples of prominent postmodern thinkers. There is Deirdre McCloskey, who is a libertarian that has written books in defence of the free market and classical liberalism. Jean-Luc Marion a student of Jacques Derrida and a Catholic theologian. John Milbank, a Christian theologian and a red Tory politically, who has written of how postmodernism freed Christianity from the need to, quote, measure up to standards of scientific truth and normative rationality. And Milbank uses this postmodern starting point to mount a defence of what he calls radical orthodoxy. There is James K. Smith, who is a religious conservative. In his book, Who's Afraid of Postmodernism, he argues that the central claims of postmodern thinkers support a radical form of Christianity, and this, in turn, supports his own conservatism. Peter Lawler was a political philosopher who championed what he called postmodern conservatism. Even holding up Peterson's hero Alexander Solzhenitsyn as a forerunner to postmodern conservatism. Alexander Dugan's fourth political theory is largely a synthesis of postmodernism and radical traditionalism. The entire movement of post-anarchism is founded on postmodern philosophy. And Richard Rorty, one of the most famous postmodern philosophers, was a liberal who criticised identity politics and the left's move away from economic issues. Rorty described himself as a postmodernist bourgeois liberal. Rorty, unlike Peterson, appreciated that postmodernism doesn't really offer any challenge to modern or liberal individualism. The natural political form of postmodernism, or liquid modernity, is libertarianism, with its social libertinism and attempt to liberate the individual from oppressive meta-narratives, tribal, religious or otherwise, imposed by collectives. Challenging postmodernism with modernism is a similar project to opposing modern forms of liberatory positive liberalism with classical liberalism. This ultimately is why Peterson must create the illusion of postmodernism as a Marxist project attempting to destroy liberal individualism to add legitimacy to his own project, that of safeguarding the same individualism from the spectre of collectivism in the form both of leftist intersectional politics and perhaps, more importantly, in the form of rightist nationalism that he is attempting to combat. Hence why Jordan Peterson will continue to be the go-to de-radicalizer and friend of the algorithms across these platforms.